German counterattack, not a major assault. It's only the constant pressure our beachheads all over the world must meet and contain. Let's take a look at one of the jobs the men do to defend themselves and the ground they capture. As our advance digs in, the engineers begin to build semi-permanent fortifications. But scarring up the nearby ground while building will lead enemy planes to their position unless they camouflage the fresh earth. Barbed wire concertinas make it hard for the enemy to attack in a hurry and by surprise. If the men seem to be moving slowly, don't blame them. They've been on the move for a week. The enemy is dropping shells a mile and a half ahead. These engineers are building their first pillbox under fire and seem to have forgotten a few things. They're putting too much in the sandbags. The sack should only be half or two-thirds full before tying the neck up tightly. The sergeant standing on top doesn't realize he makes a good target and may give away the position. He'd be safer on the ground beating the bags into place with the back of a shovel. Nearby, our men found some timber they used to reinforce the roof and the embrasure. The emplacement is in a good position, giving a clear view for field of fire. The enemy is uphill across the valley. The entrance to the emplacement is on the uphill side, away from the enemy. This sagging corner weakens the wall. The bag should have been crisscrossed at least every three or four layers. It rains a lot here, so that means digging and camouflaging a drainage trench and sump so the pillbox won't be flooded. As soon as the emplacement is built, choice Italian shrubs blending with the local growth turn it into a quiet clump of bushes. But the camouflage withers and they'll have to keep on renewing it about every three days until it's left behind by the next push forward. The tanks go forward to reconnoiter and assist later advances of the infantry. An approach march is no joyride. The tank commanders keep a close watch for the enemy above and below, keep a check on the distance between tanks, and allow fresh air inside as long as possible. The tank drivers don't need a traffic cop to keep them on the right side of the road, and as they move in, enemy artillery off to the right opens up. The enemy is trying to get the range but no ammunition is wasted by our tanks. Long-range firing is usually not their job. This is the kind of flat terrain where the enemy has close observation from high ground. Troops in the area must conceal themselves at all times. If so much as one man is spotted, he will bring fire on his whole outfit. This is a battlefield. Not the kind of a battlefield in which the men move up in squad column but one where they stay concealed. It was hard for our camera to spot them, and if you've seen an occasional soldier, your eyes are better than average. Here's one non-com, and the only reason he's up is to check on his men. Getting above the ground in this kind of an operation is permitted to the men who are assigned another, and still another. Let's take a look, concentrating on the infantry. The non-coms again, coming up cautiously to check and instruct the men who keep out of sight. These occupied foxholes in the foreground with the men not visible tell us that the GIs in them know what it's all about. The fighting outfit that wins fights as a team. Your job on this team is to stay alert and stay concealed until the order move up. A few hours after the successful surprise attack on Los Negros Island by the 1st Cavalry Division, General MacArthur arrived to congratulate the officers and men of the invading force. And congratulations are in order, for the cavalry had been trained as infantry, and all their efforts were pointed toward coordination and preparation in the new role. Here at the staging area, the dismounted horsemen work on the field packs. They must be tight, compact, and slung correctly. If not, they'll make trouble later on. Everything ready, the trucks pull out for the port of embarkation. They move at a fast clip, but nevertheless, the right intervals are held if possible. At the port of embarkation, 
a previously secured harbor, landing craft munitions, LCMs, are ready to be loaded. Each is packed tightly. There's no space or time to be wasted. Every moment lost disrupts the schedule. In the outer harbor, the transports are waiting. Destroyers this time. The transfer is done quickly. The men are careful in boarding. And the ones already on deck give the new arrivals a helping hand. Northward to the Admiralty Islands. Now there's time to sit down to clean and condition the weapons. No one has to tell them what to do. They're going in, and they know their weapons make the difference between life and death in this work. Here's a Tommy gun, the 45 caliber M28. It must be cleaned and oiled thoroughly. Now he replaces the bolt group in the receiver. The M1 Garand. Every piece of dust and dirt removed, both outside and in. This is the time to field strip it completely, to check the sights, the bolt action to get that piece in perfect working order, and each clip loaded with care and respect. The 30 caliber light machine gun, it's already been checked. These men know how to handle it. They've lived with it for months, as well as with the light 50 caliber. This one's the heavy water-cooled 30 caliber, and this soldier's happy because his sight is okay. Putting fuses into hand grenades, that calls for practiced, agile fingers. The scout observation plane, catapulted from the destroyer, its mission reconnaissance. H hour is here. Shells lined up, prepared for the five-inch guns. Reinforcements will be needed before this campaign can be finished. A couple of days later, Brigadier General William C. Chase met with his key officers. He repeated General MacArthur's words, it is imperative that we hold this position. He demanded that the soldiers on outpost duty around the perimeter exercise every precaution against night infiltration. On the 3rd of March, the reinforcements arrived. muck and sand, torn up by constant landings, bulldozers cleared a path over which the trucks could roll right out of the ships and up the beach to cover. The beachhead was well within our lines, reducing the need for dispersion. The men moved to the edge of the perimeter and then spread out and filtered through the jungle towards Momoti airfield. The Japs were retreating except for snipers. Our men dashed across the open airfield to get into jungle cover again as soon as possible. The men keep to the concealing underbrush, on the watch for Jap tricks. Machine gun fire. These men take advantage of the security of defilade position. Heavy artillery support is needed. From an inlet on the flank, through coordinated naval liaison, radio sends word to the destroyers waiting offshore for just this job. The light field pieces and mortars can be called on by telephone. CBs have already started to clean up the wrecked Momodi landing strip. As usual, the Japs left snipers behind who keep firing from the jungle at the men driving the bulldozers. This driver is making a mistake not wearing a helmet. 
It's better to have a dent in your helmet than a dent in your head. The assault troops have resumed their steady forward infiltration. The leader deploys his men to the flanks. By the time the last Japs on the island were dead, the landing strip was ready and B-25s had flown in to set up shop. From here, Los Negros, land-based planes will be able to support forward units to protect our New Guinea bases, to blockade and starve out Jap bases at Rabaul, Kavieng, Wewak. This attack was not island hopping or timid stepping stone planning. On the Admiralty Islands, we have taken a long jump forward. Part of a fighter group is the earthbound crew that keeps the machines fit to fly. So that the heart may know what the hands are doing, from time to time, officers are sent to speak to the ground crews, telling them the course and meaning of the battles at the front. The operation itself consisted of an amphibious landing south and uh, east of uh, Rome. main concentration of boats were made at the Naples Harbor and at Salerno, just around this peninsula. H hour and D day was three o'clock this morning, and the boats took off in a course which we have marked on the map here, and proceeded into the assault beaches. The beach head itself is a small town known as Anzio and just approximately two miles east of that, another small town known as Natuno. The Allied navies had the job of ferrying the troops around the mountainous Gustav line up to the invasion points. Our job was to provide cover and patrol the convoys moving up the coast. In their plans, the Allied naval leaders had a well-coordinated pattern for transporting the troops up north. The Naples and Salerno staging areas sent supplies, men, tanks, and trucks. As soon as the go signal was given, the truck convoy started to move to the harbor. I don't know if you've ever watched LSTs and LCIs being loaded, but I did on the way to Sicily. It's a good-sized organizing job. The guns, and the rest of the stuff have all got to be loaded so as it'll come out in the right order when they hit the beaches. They even take along big 155 millimeter rifles, long toms, and M4 tractors to haul them around. The standard loading procedure is to put on last the stuff they want to get out first. They stick it in the front of the boats where it'll be right at hand. The streets are always spotted with MPs to keep the traffic from tangling up. Those vehicles have all got to be kept at about the same speed. And then, too, there has to be a safe interval between them. Otherwise, you can understand that everything would be jammed up and all that traffic converge on one of those harbors. Thousands of men have got to be crammed onto the boats and every one of them is checked. Their last names are called out and they answer with their first name and middle initials. And that way, nobody sneaks in that's not supposed to. The boys are naturally sweating it out. But they keep pretty calm and wait till it's their turn. If they've been in combat before, they usually take every chance to rest. Especially when they get onto the ships, they try to relax or check on equipment, take their minds off of troubles. That convoy was like the United Nations on parade. American merchant ships, French, Dutch, and Greek. They strung up barrage balloons on the ships for protection against aerial torpedoes, dive bombing, and strafing. The initial invasion was carried on very successfully in this area, meeting with no enemy opposition. 
the part that the 79th is playing in the show at the present moment is carrying on a patrol of the convoy lanes between the Ponciani Islands and the assault beaches themselves. What our pilots reported at first when up there was mostly Higgins boats. They were going into the beach, unloading men and supplies. As far as we can make out, at the present time, there hasn't been much fireworks. And the enemy was surprised. The first waves were assault troops. They hit with American Rangers and British commandos. Standard operating procedures for the engineers to mark off with tapes where they clear the way through the minefields. Then everyone stays inside the tapes. They brought in M4 tanks right away to move on to the other side of town. During this time, the ducks kept rushing back and forth, carrying supplies from the ships offshore. The enemy had retreated when they were surprised, so the troops advanced through the town. They're supposed to move up single file along the side of the road, out of the way of the vehicles, which naturally use the roads at the same time. For those first vehicles, they sent in M10 tank destroyers against mechanized counterattacks. All this time, the planes of the 79th were patrolling the convoy lanes. They were also throwing a fighter cover of 16 aircraft over the assault area itself. The initial sorties were confined solely to patrol, but we've now been released for the purpose of strafing. After a few days, the recently used German rest camps of Anzio and Natuno are now an allied springboard. The Luftwaffe persisted in heckling our men after the landing. But our anti-aircraft was ready for them. There was some damage, but our beachhead was already secured and remained secure despite growing pressure from the enemy. The inevitable counterattack led by German artillery came. But their fire was answered. Dive bomber sneaked in to get a loaded munitions boat, but they didn't have a chance to drive us from our newly won position.